Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to 10 years of ICT Austria. I would first like to welcome Alexander van der Bellen, Federal President of the Republic of Austria, and Mrs. Doris Schmidauer. I would like to welcome Johanna Mikleitner, Governor of Lower Austria. Okay. I would also like to welcome Barbara Weitgruber, Director General for Scientific Research and International Relations, representing Iris Rauskala, Federal Minister of Education, Science and Research. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, we are deeply honored that so many distinguished guests are here to celebrate our 10-year anniversary with us. To illustrate the extraordinarily high level of our audience, in addition to the federal president, there are more than 15 other presidents, former presidents, and honorary presidents of various organizations and institutions here tonight. And they constitute only a fraction of our guests of honor today. So I kindly ask you for your understanding that I, also in view of the ambitious program for this evening, will refrain from extending further individual salutations. Instead, allow me to extend my warmest welcome to several groups of guests this evening, and we can give them an applause together in the end. I would like to welcome all representatives of foreign missions in Austria, all representatives and members of the national and state parliaments, all representatives of various federations, federal, state, and local authorities, I would like to welcome all rectors of universities, all representatives of research institutes, academies, and funding agencies, and all representatives of political parties, the civil service of the Republic, and of Lower Austria. Allow me further to welcome all board members of ISD Austria and all members of the ISD Austria Foundation and ISD Austria donors. And finally, let me welcome our esteemed panelists, who will be introduced in detail later in the program. Welcome to all of you. Dear ladies and gentlemen, I'm honored to welcome you to tonight's event celebrating 10 years of ISD Austria. When I was approached in 2008 about the opportunity to become the Institute's first president, I was immediately intrigued by the idea, which originated with Anton Zeilinger, of building in Austria a world-class research institution completely from scratch. The vision that was written by Heim Harari, Olaf Kübler, and Hubert Markel, laid out the principle of, principles of autonomy, internationality, and multidisciplinarity on a single campus as its cornerstones. In addition to performing basic research, another core mission of the Institute would be to educate the next generation of scientists by conferring PhD degrees. Although I had lived and worked abroad for several decades at that time, this opportunity, which ultimately brought me back to my native Austria, was too fascinating to pass up. When I first came to campus, one large construction site covered the entire area. On June 1st, 2009, exactly 10 years ago, the ISD Austria campus was officially inaugurated in this very lecture hall with five professors, 37 employees, and grand ambitions. Only theoretical science was possible for the first couple of years. The first experimental building, the Bertalanffy Foundation building, opened in 2011. I was always convinced that the Institute would succeed only if we stick to its basic principles. Hire the best and provide them with an environment that allows them to do their best possible research. Nonetheless, nobody at that time could be sure that the project would succeed. And there were some sleepless nights along the way. Today, we are far from being done. 
But we can already say one thing with certainty. The model works, probably better than anyone could expect, and we are heading in the right direction. After 10 years, we have a vibrant and lively campus where scientists from 60 nations perform curiosity-driven research. Allow me to illustrate my point with some facts and figures. In the past 10 years, we have appointed 55 professors selected from over 11,500 applicants. Our faculty has collectively acquired more than 40 grants from the European Research Council. With an ERC success rate of close to 50%, we are number one in Europe, well ahead of established institutions. <laughs> well ahead of institutions like ETH Zurich, Max Planck, Oxford, Cambridge, and yes, also ahead of the Institute's role model, the Weizmann Institute. The journal Nature listed IST Austria last year among its top 10 rising stars, along with nine other institutions that were founded in the past 30 years, and we are the only such institution in Europe, and the only one that is not located in Asia. One of the key factors behind our success has been the bold and visionary support by our main stakeholders, the Federal Republic of Austria and the State of Lower Austria. They founded IST as a fully independent institution within the Austrian science system, which allows us to offer scientific career models according to international standards from the graduate school for students to the tenure track for professors. We are completely free to select our scientists and our fields of research with excellence and scientific promise as the only criteria always in search of the best and brightest minds, never bound by predetermined strategies. Finally, and perhaps most importantly, we are given a long-term budget, currently until 2026, that can be spent with great flexibility and permits long-range thinking and planning, which is so important in basic science. We have passed many milestones in the past 10 years in construction, recruitment, research, awards, fundraising, but our development is still incomplete. In order to permanently establish IST Austria as one of the players in the global top league, we need to reach a critical mass for sustainable success and global visibility in science. To achieve this goal, Comparisons with similar institutions show that ISD Austria would need to roughly triple in size and continue its current growth uh, to approximately 150 groups by 2036. I trust that the government of Lower Austria and also the next government of Austria will, <laughs> will continue to support this vision of ISD Austria as a global player with all the benefits this will bring to the country's reputation and prosperity, and that they will continue to provide us with the necessary long-term flexible financing and institutional independence. Such a pledge of support is required sooner rather than later, and ISD Austria is living proof what purposeful and courageous science policy can achieve. Let's keep this going. Let me end by extending my sincere gratitude to all those involved in this project over the past 10 years. Of course, a research institute like ISD Austria needs adequate buildings and technical infrastructure, carefully designed regulations and processes, and unwavering political support. But what fills it with life are the hundreds of dedicated people, from the scientists and the scientific support staff to the administrative staff. Each and every one of you has shaped this institute over the past decade in a myriad of different ways with your ideas and your hard work. I would like to thank everybody who contributed to making ISD Austria the success it is today. The initial vision turned into a reality. And though we are not done yet in reaching our lofty goals, I look forward to a bright future and working towards it with all our supporters and employees. Let us keep our drive and our commitment going forward, contributing to the local community, to the low Austrian, national, and European competitiveness, and to global society through basic research, graduate education, 
technology transfer and scientific outreach. Let us continue to be a strong beacon of light in the world. Tonight, I look forward to inspiring discussions and spirited celebrations of all that we have achieved together. Thank you. And now, ladies and gentlemen, let me welcome to this stage the Pre Federal President of the Republic of Austria, Alexander Van der Bellen. Well, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, I can be very short and say I fully agree with President Hensinger. Um, <laughs> Auf Deutsch, ich stimme voll inhaltlich mit Ihnen überein. Außer vielleicht, dass Sie die Vorgeschichte des Instituts etwas zu, äh, wie soll ich sagen, etwas zu freundlich geschildert haben. Um, I was in Parliament at the time when the law was passed con, uh, concerning the IST Austria. And I remember very well the discussions that uh, came up uh, when Professor Zeilinger first um, mentioned this idea in public. The universities were in panic um, <laughs> because they thought that the financing would be turned away from them and given instead of to the to ISD Austria. So it was really, um, I think, a very important step by the Industriellen Vereinigung, the, um, what do you, what do you, what are you, what are you in English? Industriellen? <laughs> Federation of Austrian Industry, thank you. Uh, Federation of Austrian Industry, when they stepped in with a considerable amount of money for the time then, it was really a considerable amount of money. Um, still, I must confess, I was in Parliament then, and I can't, for the hell, remember uh, how I voted in the... When. <laughs> um, Because the question was, should we take seriously all the um, bedenken, uh, the, all the, uh, the, the concerns of, of the university, universities and other, other institutes of research, or should we believe in the political statements of the time? And uh, uh, you, can, you can perhaps understand that to believe in political statements as a member of the opposition is not easy. <laughs> um, but then... Uh, <clears throat> but then the institute finally, the law was passed, the financing was guaranteed uh, with the help of the Austrian Federation of Industry and uh, the Institute started to work with President Hensinger at the top. Um, and one day, fairly soon I think, I got a telephone call by uh, Professor Arnold Schmidt and he said to me, um, hören Sie, ein österreichisches Wunder ist passiert. Uh, listen, an Austrian miracle uh, has happened. The Institute works actually. <laughs> 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 and it works fine, and it is really a top institute, and is and is going to 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 grow into this international reputation uh, very fast. So I came here, I visited the the IST, I was duly impressed. Um, well, and that's about it. What I think was, you mentioned it already, President Hensinger. But what was really important? I think the role of Pre Professor Harari. Uh, cannot be overestimated. That was really the breakthrough uh, in, the, in the discussion. <laughs> Somehow, uh, Professor Harari was able to persuade 
the political decision makers of the time that the, the model of the Weizmann Institute is the direction we should go. And that was really important. Um, I think I visited you at the Weizmann Institute in 2012, must have been. So the Institute was already uh, well underway at, at, at the time. <coughs> so we have our Weizmann Institute now. Um, mm, what was important was the long-term financing to be independent of the yearly budgetary decisions of the federal government. Extremely important, this step, extremely important. Um, also against the opposition of some, of some uh, university professors who said we want to have the same thing. Understandable, but no reason to block the IST. Uh, another thing was no political interference. That wasn't easy again. Um, no political interference wherever. Uh, thirdly, as far as I remember, an insistence on the importance of personalities instead of research areas. Uh, really a different uh, a difference to the existing universities. And then um, you have a board, you have to you have to um, defend your, your, your actions, but what you said, I mean, um, nobody has this kind of ERC grants in quantity and quality. Um, the quantity and quality of applications of, of applicants for either the, the PhD program or the postdoc uh, programs. So this, this uh, das spricht alles für sich selbst. Also, I think I can finish at this point. Uh, <laughs> I wish you really all the best. It as ist ein österreichisches Wunder passiert. Es ist jedenfalls in Österreich passiert dieses Wunder. <laughs> with the help, with the help of, of all of you coming from all parts of the world, this miracle has happened. Thank you very much for helping us to do that. Really, I congratulate you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and thank you, Professor Hensinger. Science, especially in new institutions like the ISD, we've just heard it, needs political support. Without the political support, none of what you see here would be here, however difficult that political support might have come about. Um, yeah, well, I am sure you're all aware of the political turbulences we've been through over the past a little more than two weeks. Nobody knows better than you, Mr. President. It's an honor to have you here. The new Chancellor and new Minister of Science just inaugurated yesterday had to excuse themselves. We are, therefore, even happier than we would have been anyways to welcome the Governor of the State of Lower Austria, Johanna Mikkel-Leitner. Please. You've been governor of Lower Austria for two years and you've come to the ISD various times before. Additionally, you live close to here in Klosterneuburg. I'm sure you have a couple of very personal experiences with the ISD over the past years. Can you give us some examples? Yes, uh, in fact, I have a very special connection to the IST Austria. I have a special connection to IST Austria since the founding of the IST Austria 10 years ago. And I'm much aware about the importance of the IST Austria uh, because, uh, as you might uh, remember, uh, Lower Austria was located close to the Iron Curtain more than three decades. And until the fall of the Iron Curtain, uh, there were no universities, no colleges, there were no infrastructure, there were no uh, uh, research, researching and uh, scientific and researching uh, institutes, and there were no uh, company settlements as well as no available jobs either. And however, in the meantime, time we have uh, been investing into infrastructure, into universities and colleges, uh, and we have also invested uh, into scientific and research institutes. And I strongly believe that uh, 
the most important investments uh, in these past years has been the investment uh, in the ISD Austria. And so, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to congratulate uh, the ISD Austria and as well as uh, all those uh, responsible uh, for, its, uh, str for the strong commitment and for uh, this success story. And, uh, and I'm very proud to see how successful the ISD uh, has uh, become. And as you, uh, as, uh, you know, I live close to the ISD Austria, uh, and I'm very proud to see how successful and how it keeps uh, it growing. And I'm very proud of the development of the ISD Austria. And when I think of the most a uh, pleasant encounter I have ever had in this regard. I would uh, like to say, uh, I think it was during my visit to the Weizmann Institute in Israel uh, two years ago where I met Haim Harari. And during our meeting he said that he actually considered the IST Austria as uh, the Weizmann Institute sisters. And I think this is a very extremely... Uh, valuable uh, compliment for all those uh, uh, who have participated in the success story. So congratulations to all of you. You did really a great job. Many thanks, congratulations. <laughs> now, now, since this is a birthday party, there's also time for wishes. What would you wish for IST's future? I'm very much aware of, uh, uh, of the success story, but I think it's not the end because we know uh, that research uh, and uh, science uh, serve as uh, a necessary base for um, positive economic uh, development. And so uh, we have much to do in the next 10 years. Uh, and regarding ISD uh, Austria's future, I, uh, I actually have three wishes. Uh, firstly, uh, that uh, the best of the best uh, will continue their research here. Uh, secondly, uh, that, we, uh, that we will continue to familiarize the kids uh, with uh, research uh, and science. And thirdly, uh, I wish that uh, the new technology park uh, at the campus uh, will, keep, uh, will keep growing. Uh, and I think we are on the right way. And so I would like to say many thanks for the very good cooperation between Lower Austria, the government of Lower Austria, uh, and the team of the ISD Austria. Especially many thanks uh, to uh, President Hensinger. He did a very good job. And many thanks for, real, for the very, very um, nice cooperation. And we are very proud to have you here as a president. And you can be proud of your job here. You can be proud of your team. Congratulations. Um, thank you very much, Mrs. Governor. I'm sure we'll see you here a lot more, not only for the opening of new buildings, but also for the opening of children's events at the... You, you just made a lot of fans at the Forschungsfest. Uh, sorry, I have forgot. <laughs> uh, to say some words uh, to President Hensinger. Uh, I will promise to you that Lower Austria will uh, also invest here in the IST Austria. Uh, you can count on us also in the future and we are in a close cooperation in this way and I think uh, we will make the next contract in the next month. <laughs> Now there, there we go for a first birthday present. <laughs> With this, it's time for some music. I proudly present Trumpets Vienna and their piece Street Trumpet Number no. One. Mm -hmm. 
Trumpets Vienna. Let me now introduce our keynote speaker, Michael Ignatieff. Born in Canada, he has a long career as historian, university professor, writer, and former politician, a career of which I would just like to give you a few glimpses. After his studies at the universities of Toronto and Harvard, he spent a few years at the British Columbia University. He then moved to Great Britain, where he worked at the King's College in London and taught at the universities of Oxford and Cambridge, amongst others. All during the time, he also worked as a journalist, writing for various newspapers and, in the early years of the millennium, for TV and radio shows, mainly of the BBC, which made him known to a greater audience, especially in the English-speaking world. He then returned to Canada and from 2006 to 2011 served as a member of parliament at the Canadian Parliament um, and then as a leader of the Liberal Party of Canada and leader of the official opposition. After his years in politics, he first served as the Centennial Chair at the Carnegie Council for Ethics in International Affairs in New York and then he was an Edward R. Murrow Professor of the Practice of the Press, Policy and Public politics and public policy at the Harvard Kennedy School. He's also a renowned author of many non-fictious books as well as novels. I could give you a long list of titles now, but I'll keep it to the last one. The Ordinary Virtues, Moral Order in a Divided World was published in 2017. Currently, Michael Ignatieff is Rector and President of the Central European University in Budapest, Please, Mr. Ignatiev, give us your keynote lecture on science in challenging times. It should go without saying it's an enormous honor to be here in the, in the presence of President uh, van der Bellen, President Hensinger, President van der Bellen, and President Hensinger together gave a kind of master class in the institutional political conditions necessary for success of an institution and for the flourishing of academic freedom. And needless to say, Professor, uh, President van der Bellen has given us all a master class in how to discharge the constitutional duties of his office. So <laughs> it's, it's a big moment for me to be here. I'm delighted to be part of this anniversary, and uh, I look forward to future collaborations between IST and this little junior institution that's coming to Vienna in September, Central European University. Um, my subject is uh, academic freedom in challenging times, and the times certainly are challenging, and I'll try to explain why the times are so challenging. But I want to step back for a minute and ask a very different question, which is why academic freedom is difficult at any time. 
We often forget just what a struggle it is to think a new thought, to be a free man and woman in any intellectual profession. And all it takes, however, is one great person to remind us of just how hard it can be. A couple of weeks ago, I was reading the Guardian newspaper and read the obituary of a scientist who many of you will know, Murray Gelman, who was the Nobel Prize winning physicist who in the 1960s named quarks and classified subatomic particles. He died a couple of weeks ago in California. And I found a, a wonderful online interview with Murray Gelman. You should go onto the Guardian website, you'll find it. It's a, it's a, it's a wonderful scientist's attempt to describe how tough it is to be a good scientist. Um, and he explained the work that won him the Nobel Prize. He said, for example, that the name for quarks, as you may know, came to him from James Joyce's Finnegan's Wake. It's a wonderful idea that a physicist would get a name for a subatomic particle from a piece of 20th century literature that almost nobody can understand. It seemed a kind of wonderful example of cross-fertilization between science and literature when they both interact inside a great mind. And he said something interesting. He said the intellectual challenge in the classification of the particles was trivial. The real obstacle was belief. The belief that those particles could only operate in certain ways and not in others, just as he said, the obstacle that Einstein had faced in 1905 in developing his theory of relativity was the belief in the absolute nature of space and time in the Newtonian universe. So, and it's not just belief, because b behind belief in science lies career structures that are dependent on those beliefs. Uh, those beliefs seem to explain everything that needs explaining, so they seem scientific and rational. In other words, they seem to be the last word on the subject. And when beliefs of that sort encounter something they can't explain, they just refuse to accept it. So why am I beginning here with the issue of belief as being a problem in the progress of science? It's because it raises a troubling question about academic freedom, because the purpose of academic freedom, after all, is to enable men and women to think freely. Um, but then the question, which I think, even at a moment of triumph like this, and this is a moment of triumph for a great institution, but it's also a moment to ask a much more painful question, which is, are scientists really free? Or are they shackled by beliefs in theories, hypotheses, research projects, career structures that make them more resistance than they realize to insurgent hypothesis and inconvenient truths? It's one of the reasons, this question is one of the reasons we need to see scientific freedom in dramatic terms as a struggle, as a battle to pull free of false belief. In order, in order to come to terms with what is inexplicable according to traditional criteria. It takes a particularly resolute and courageous kind of psychology to overcome accepted belief. And that's exactly why we think of people like Murray Gelman, Albert Einstein, Isaac Newton, Richard Feynman as heroes. Because once they've done their work, a new structure of belief takes root and it in turn endures until there's another crisis of belief triggered by a discordant result that falsifies a known theory and then the process of disruption starts again. And we're now familiar with that in the history of science thanks to Thomas Kuhn and Paul Feyerabend and others. We no longer think of scientific progress as linear and organic but as stochastic and disruptive. And these theorists have shown how radical breakthroughs disrupt existing paradigms only to crystallize into paradigms themselves that then Im impede the emergence of the next critical wave of thinking. This history of science, which of which you're all familiar, raises a difficult question for institutions like IST and for institutions like my own because it raises the question of whether our scientific institutions 
our peer review mechanisms, our promotion protocols, our forms of scientific hierarchy, does this m machinery impede or enhance a single individual's ability to think a critical, radical new thought? So when posed in this rhetorical form, you know what my answer is. And my answer is no. Institutions that are nominally friends to academic freedom can actually prove to be their enemy. Now, on a night like this, which is a night of celebration of a great institution, I have no desire to be provocative for the sake of being provocative. So let me ask the question again, this time a little more carefully. Let's ask a counterfactual. Let's suppose our radical free thinker had to work on a desert island. Immediately, we see that our radical free thinker would be helpless. He or she, in fact, all of us, were, are not only dependent on the institutional structures of organized science, we are, most of the time, empowered by them. These systems enable the radical thinker to focus exclusively on a single aspect of research and bring to bear on that problem the vast capabilities of the scientific system. Even more than that, the radical thinker's very capacity to identify the problem that he or she wants to solve can only be brought into focus by the practices of institutions exactly like this. Thesis supervisors who point the way to an unsolved problem, review committees that turn down an idea because it's already been dealt with, literature reviews that clear away the debris in a field and point the way to the next big problem. Without this signaling system, no genius can hope to identify his or her problem, let alone solve it. And we know that geniuses do not work alone. That's why you have something like ISD, because you need to create the infrastructure that makes genius possible. Murray Gelman depended on the sociological organization of science to recruit for him the brilliant graduate students who helped him all along through his career. The only Nobel Prize winner that I've had the honor to know, John Polanyi, Nobel laureate in chemistry from Canada, was always quick to tell me, the one thing you need to know about science is that it's a team sport. So let's review then my original question, which is whether the apparatus of science is an enemy of academic freedom, and say on the contrary, that modern science has been relatively successful in bureaucratizing and routinizing itself without crushing the radical spirit on which innovation depends. This is the balance that a great institution has to maintain, providing just enough bureaucracy to let you do your work, but not so much bureaucracy that it crushes the radical idea. Let's also say that the scientific division of labor depends critically on the whole institutional structure of peer review, and the, the purpose of peer review is to prevent powerful voices, powerful politicians, powerful anybody putting their thumb on the scale. To an outsider my, like me, I'm a historian, not a scientist, scientific peer review has managed to sustain the authority of natural science at a time when the intellectual authority of social science and the humanities is under attack everywhere. Having given it science its due, having reversed my additional no and given you a cautious yes, I would add that the Achilles heel of free societies, the Achilles heel of great institutions like this one, is complacency. Institutional leaders in science should always be worried whether their institutes genuinely empower free thought. And unless we worry about this problem, unless we get up in the morning as institutional leaders and worry about it, we can become complacent defenders of orthodoxy. And we, we make the further mistake of taking the story of the heroes of science, Gelman, Einstein, Richard Feynman, as the story of science, and fail to ask the troubling question of how many of science's failures were caused by the failures of institutions to listen to hear an unconventional, strange, even mad idea. So one necessity for anyone who is in charge of a free institution is to make sure that it cherishes dissent, eccentricity, odd ideas, peculiar behavior, and in particular challenges to disciplinary orthodoxy 
As the embattled president of a university, I spent a lot of my time defending peculiar behavior, I can tell you. But protecting academic freedom means more than protecting eccentricity. It also requires us to exercise vigilance about our peer review procedures, our recruitment systems, our job talks, the whole structure of academic selection to ensure that prejudice, conventional wisdom, or received ideologies do not end up shutting out new ideas. We also need to be clear about what we owe the wider society just beyond these doors. They pay the bills. Even privately funded universities like the one I leave believe we exist to train responsible citizens of a free society. CU has gone a pretentious step further and we actually believe that we should train our students in the habits and beliefs of an open society. By open, we mean open to strangers, open to foreigners, open to challenges to existing traditions and cultures. But that doesn't mean something only negative, it means a positive respect for authority on condition that authority gives reasons for public measures and allow those measures to be tested by research. And clearly, the very idea of an open society makes the claim that science, both natural and social science, has a central public role in questioning and testing political claims to truth. Needless to say, an institution that takes on that kind of sense of its role has a lot of responsibilities. And the first one is to struggle to maintain some respect for truth, or more precisely, to maintain the difference between ideology on the one hand and knowledge on the other. God knows, as a historian and public commentator, I've done my fair share of producing ideology. <laughs> but we should remember that the purpose of free institutions is not the production of ideology, but the production of knowledge. And our key social function is when we graduate students, we want them to know the difference. And no political order can make effective public choices without this idea of knowledge. Our public world is drowning in information, rumor, media, all of it diffused at the speed of light. Our political debate has never been in more need of knowledge. We face daunting challenges from ecological disaster to the collapse of democracy itself. And in these matters, public choice determined by ideology might prove fatal, whereas choices shaped by knowledge might give us a chance to survive and who knows, even flourish. Um, I, I have to add, because I'm a social scientist, that social scientists face more pressures from fashion and ideology than the natural sciences. You're very lucky in that regard. When I was a graduate student at Harvard in the 1970s, I felt as a young man in a force field of ideological pressure. First it was Marxism, then it was Foucault, then it was structuralist, then it was post-structuralist. As a young man, you had to fight to keep yourself standing up. You had to fight to have a sense of your own intellectual autonomy. And now, as an old man, I look back on, the, on my youth and realize how little trace these fashions and theories left on my own work as a scholar and a writer. At the time, I felt myself obliged to define myself in relation to them, and now I look at many of them as enemies of intellectual freedom. These fashions today are turbocharged by the social media. If you subscribe to them, you get published, you get hired, you get promoted. If you don't use certain incantatory magic words in the social sciences, you may not have the career you want. So, as the custodian or temporary custodian of a social science institution, this is a real concern to guarantee academic freedom so that um, my university is free of the tyranny of intellectual fashion. That's why I've started with Murray Gelman's question and that's why I'm putting it uh, on the table here tonight. The astounding progress of natural science in the 20th century suggests that we have almost despite ourselves, created an ecology of free institutions that does facilitate innovation. But as I come to the conclusion of these remarks, we have to understand this sense in which 
These institutions are vulnerable. This is a night of celebration, and I, I, the last thing I want to do is pour a glass of cold water down your neck. But I do have to tell you that if you look south from Vienna, just a couple of hours from here, there's a country with a very great scientific tradition that is experiencing a direct attack on academic freedom. And I don't mean the CEU story, which I will not bore you with. This is the week in which the government of Hungary introduced legislation removing from its oldest and most distinguished academic institution, the Academy of Sciences, control over its scientific and research centers, vesting them and the funding that once went to them exclusively to a government depart department controlled by one of the prime minister's closest associates. All I would say about this is that if you absolutely want to guarantee the destruction of academic freedom in a great country and ensure the flight of scientists from your country and condemn the rest to provincial subservience to government, this is how you do it. The government's rationale is worth noticing. You will not be surprised to see here, the rationale is that government research money is scarce and the government has the right to allocate it where it's most likely to result in technological and economic benefits for the majority of society. All I would say with the greatest respect, and I don't want to drag any of these distinguished politicians into my, my political um, um, positions on this matter or embarrass anybody, but this kind of majoritarian argument the use of arguments from the will of the people and the democratic mandate that governments claim is being used in this case to strip power from every counter majoritarian institution in your neighbor, the courts, the media, government regulators, and this is the point, scientific institutions. I see no evidence, you'll be delighted to know, not yet, that other uh, movements in Europe, populist movements in Europe, are turning their attention to science and scientific institutions. No party in Austria, for example, has given any indication that it's heading in this direction, and you should <laughs> make sure that remains the case. But you do need to understand the freedom that you enjoy in this room is a creation of democracy. It is made possible by democracy, and academic freedom is integral to the the survival of democracy. And you have been warned because it's happening next door. Let me um, just conclude with um, one final thought. In September, my university, CU, will be coming to Vienna and we're looking forward to being your neighbors or your colleagues and your partners. Uh, we'll be down the road in Vienna, but we hope to be close. And we're, in particular, we're hoping that our ethicists, philosophers, historians, sociologists, and political scientists can work with your natural scientists to think through the human implications of the new technologies, artificial intelligence, biotechnology, it's a thing that are developing in your labs right now. These will transform our societies for good and perhaps sometimes for ill. The societies we serve are worried about these technologies? Will they destroy the world of work in which most of us find our worth and meaning? Will the application of machine intelligence lead to a devaluation of what is specifically human? Our societies are right to say to us, these are not questions that can be left to us alone. We pay for your work, your work will change our lives, so explain to us what you're doing. Justify your research. Explore the moral and political challenges that it presents and come back to us with answers that we can understand and believe. This is an activity speaking to the public about the social, political, and philosophical implications of science and technology, in which I think a social science university like ours could make a small contribution. Um, but it remains for me to say what an honor it's been to have this chance to talk to you about academic freedom, to share um, my enormous pride in, or my associated pride in your achievements and hope that we can be partners in the year ahead. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ignatiev. We will see you back here on stage in a minute with probably a lot more discussion on your last point, the interaction of science and society. Um, it wasn't really quiet in here yet, but many of you may remember the video we saw at the very beginning. You saw a bird's eye view of the campus as it stands today, followed by some images of the construction works, the many construction works that led to the current campus. And in the end of the video, it said, a beacon for excellence, for scientific excellence in Austria. The film we are about to see now is taking you right into that beacon, into the buildings, to the heart of the science happening here. Have a look. My name is Gaia Novarino and I'm working at the Institute of Science and Technology, Austria. Essentially, is a, a research institute uh, that is doing uh, top-notch research. My name is Joris Katsaros and I'm working in the field of semiconductor physics. So what we do is really fundamental research. So the long-term dream is really the, the holy grail, this quantum computer. But what drives me every day is really to understand basic physics. Well, in 10 years, I hope that we will be mentioned as one of the top places, not just in Europe. And that's why we are all doing our best. Before we continue with our program, please join me in saying goodbye to President van der Bellen and Mrs. Schmiedinger, who have to leave us at this point. Thanks a lot for coming. Thank you, Mr. President. Auf Wiedersehen. Scientists at the ISD Austria want to improve our world, as we could just see and hear in that video. Therefore, the ISD needs to not only excel in science, but also involve society in discussions about how science and technology may help to get the world many or most of us may want. How science and society can team up to form a rewarding partnership is the topic of the following high-level panel discussions. Let me introduce the speakers to you. The first one you already know, Michael Ignatiev, may I ask you back on stage and to this seat, please. Next is Alice Dautry. She's former president of the Institut Pasteur in France. Professor Dautry is a trained physicist and molecular and cell biologist. She has worked in 
Paris, New York, National Institutes of Health, Massachusetts Institutes of Technology, just to name a few. She has published some 130 articles dealing with her studies in biochemistry, cell biology, immunology, and infectious diseases. From 2003 to 2004, she's been president of the Institut Pasteur. She's a member of the German Academy of Sciences Leopoldina and the Academy of Technologies in France. She is officier of the French National Order of the Légion d'Honneur. She is or has been a member of boards of trustees and scientific councils of research institutions, international organizations and companies including the European Research Council Advisory Committee, and she is a member of the board of the IST Austria. Professor Dutri, please, would you like to take this chair? <laughs> Edith Hurd is Director General of the European Molecular Biology Laboratory in Germany. Professor Hurd was trained as a geneticist at Cambridge University and carried out her doctoral work at the Imperial College Research Fund in London. During her postdoc at the Institut Pasteur in Paris, she began her work on mammalian X chromosome inactivation and the role of regulation and non-regulation of non-coding RNA. She headed the mammalian developmental epigenetics team at the Institut Curie in Paris and was director of the Genetics and Developmental Biology Department until the end of 2018. This year's January, she became the fifth and first female director general of the European Molecular Biology Lab. She is also professor of epigenetics and cellular memory at the Collège de France. Her lab there still focuses on epigenetic processes in mammals. She's a fellow of the Royal Society and has been awarded prizes, including the Grand Prix in CERM in 2017. Professor Hurd, may I please ask you to take the fourth chair? <laughs> Next president, Daniel Seifman is president of the Weizmann Institute in Israel. Professor Seifman has a PhD in atomic physics from the Technion, Israel Institute of Technology. He joined the Weizmann Institute, Institute's Department of Particle Physics in 1991. Since 2001, he has also been an external member of the Max Planck Institute of Nuclear Physics in Heidelberg, of which he was also director from 2005 to 6. Then in 2006, he was elected the 10th and, if I may say so, youngest ever president of the Weizmann Institute of Science. As president, Daniel Seifman has given priority to sustaining the Institute's high standards of excellence. He has led the establishment of several research schools, centers, institutes, and infrastructure projects under his leadership, the Weizmann Institute has increasingly become a hub of international science. And the Weizmann Institute, during all that time and even before, as we have heard, has always been a role model for the IST Austria up to this very day. So, President Seifmann, please take the fifth chair there. <laughs> Now, there's only one president missing on this illustrious panel, um, one whom you all already know, although he has not yet been properly introduced. Thomas Hensinger, president of the IST Austria. He holds a degree in computer science from the Kepler University Linz, a degree in computer and information sciences from the University of Delaware, and a PhD in computer science from Stanford University. He was assistant professor of computer sciences at Cornell University, followed by eight years at the University of Berkeley, where he became professor of electri electrical engineering and computer sciences. During that time, on top, in 1999, he was also director at the Max Planck Institute for Computer Sciences in Saarbrücken. 
2004 is the year that finally saw you come back to Europe, first to Switzerland, where you were professor of computer and communication science at the Ecole Polytechnique Fédérale de Lausanne, the ETH Lausanne, in 2008, as we have already heard, you were appointed first president of the IST Austria presidency, started officially September 1st, 2009. You're an IC highly ranked, highly cited researcher, received the Milner, not yet, you may not get up yet, <laughs> there's a little more to say um, about all your, <laughs> everything that you um, achieved, you received the Milner Award of the Royal Society, the Wittgenstein Award of the Austrian Science Fund, and the, an ERC Advanced Investigator Grant. And you are the person who created the IST Austria from the beginning. Without you, it wouldn't be where it is today. So let's all give a warm applause to President Hensinger. <laughs> And with this, I hand over to you, President Hensinger, for the moderation of this prestigious panel's discussion. Thank, thank you. Yeah, the topic of the panel is the relationship between science and society. And I would like to start with, with a simple question that I want to ask all of you. Uh, the question is, how can an institution like this or like yours uh, build public support of science, and what's perhaps even more important these days, public trust in science. Maybe let me start with Daniel and then we go down. Yeah. Well, that's a complicated question which I don't believe has a simple answer, and there are of course many, many factors. Maybe if we look a bit on you know, what happened over the last hundred years, we realize that in fact the trust in science has decreased even though the society we're living in is actually based on science way more than it used to be 100 years ago. So there's sort of a dichotomy here. We are facing that most people know about the impact of science. I mean, we use it every day. That's why we can live much longer than we used to live 100 years ago. Yet, there's more and more of a lack of trust. And I think there are many factors that are leading. I just try to point maybe to one or two. The first one, I would say, is in fact, that um, we do not communicate right as institutions of um, research, scientific research, while those who are producing technology based on our science that we have been developed for hundreds of years are actually communicating, communicating very well. You take Google, you take Apple, you take Samsung, you take all these companies, and the world is made believe that they've made these inventions, which is of course not true. The reason these companies, including of course all drug companies, can survive and develop and create these drugs and these devices is because of the fundamental sciences that has been developed over many decades before that, including in this place. And it's never been shown really the way, the trajectory from the original ideas from what science is all about all the way to these devices and these drugs. And I think we've been failing in a way, and maybe they've told the agenda in another way, but we cannot accuse them, they are commercial companies. And I think people believe today that science is done at Google and at Samsung and not at the ES IST Austria. And we know very well that if you stop a place like IST Austria, then there will be no Samsung and no Apple in 20 years from now. So I think we're a victim, if you want, a bit of the success of science, of what happened over the last 100 years and the fact that it's actually had a huge impact on society while the society actually doesn't really understand. And the second thing I'd like to say, and I'll be very short, at least in the United States, there was recently a review in, or if, if one, uh, 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 probing with the public about how much do you believe in the United States is spent from the federal budgets on research in universities. You just ask the people in the street, but you also ask the people you know, in different states at high level, and they were off by order of magnitudes. I mean, they thought that they're spending way more money than actually was spent. People don't know how little actually is being spent on scientific research. And I think that's another piece of story which is hidden. When one says that you know, research is very expensive, people don't know how little actually is being spent. And I think we need to communicate this way 
and to do that in a much, much better way to bring back to ourselves, the scientific institutions, what exactly is our role and how much we've changed society and how much this had an impact on the technology we are using today. It's a story to be, that we still need to say. Thank you. So, first of all, I'd like to wish you a happy birthday. I'm Thank very you. impressed by the IST. So in terms of science and society, maybe I can give uh, two answers, one which is more personal and the other which is more institutional. So I'll start with the second. So at EMBL, if you would like suggestions about uh, how to go forward, the, um, we set up, uh, before my time of course, more than 20 years ago, a science and society program which really was to try and engage with the public, to bring the public to EMBL, to, to, to listen to science, to talk to scientists, but also um, for science to go out to the public. And um, this has led to the organization of conferences uh, on different sites. EMBL is organized on six sites in Europe. So it's actually a, a very good way to give the scientists that uh, interface with the public that I think is so important. And for example, over 10 years ago, they organized a conference on biodiversity, uh, the collapse of biodiversity, and it was put online, and I hugely watched, actually. So this, I think, is one tool, one way that we should be thinking about and propagating even more. And it's become, I think, absolutely critical in this day and age that we fight against um, this loss of, of the uh, belief in truth. Uh, science is about truth, and it, it's up to us, the onus is on us, the scientists, the institutes, to actually make sure that this truth is put out there. So then my second uh, point, which is more personal, um, as a scientist myself in a field uh, which has sometimes been controversial, some, sometimes been misinterpreted, epigenetics, um, for many years, I would just get on with my experiments. I'd be very happy to go to my scientific meetings, to have a little chat with my scientist friends, to think about wild ideas, go back and do some experiments. And then I realized that um, this uh, sort of uh, controversy was backfiring. We, our field was not getting funded. Uh, people were skeptical. And I also realized that people around me, uh, my friends who were not scientists, uh, were starting to question the, um, yes, the scientific approach in general and why, as biologists, we should be doing fundamental research. Why were we not out there just curing cancer or disease? And so when I was offered um, to become a professor at the Collège de France, which is a very unique uh, institution, uh, I accepted really for that reason. Basically, I have to give public lectures um, every year on a different topic. I have to stand up there in an audience and anyone can walk in from the street. It's, it was terrifying in the beginning, but it's actually um, amazing because you can really engage with school children, with taxi drivers, with Nobel Prize winners. Anyone can walk in off the street. Everything is filmed. It's put online so everyone can watch. It's in French, by the way, so that's also a challenge. Um, but this really showed me that it, it's up to us. It's up to us individuals to engage with the public and to make sure that we set the record straight and more importantly, that we transmit our passion for what we do and for the importance of striving to do research that may only pay off in 10, 20, or even 100 years' time. So that would be my suggestion to the IST. Go out there and convince the public individually and, and as an institution. Thank you. So uh, my suggestion would be quite related to that. Uh, and it's linked to my personal experience. Uh, science is very demanding, and scientists are extremely focused, and they have to work hard and concentrate on what they are doing. But despite that, I think it's very important as an institution to get all the scientists involved in communicating with the public. So what I started in my institution was a program where, where I picked up any scientist and systematically, I mean, they all were put in the hot pot to have and go and discuss with the public on any occasion. And of course, there was a lot of resistance because scientists in general don't like it. First, they are, mm -hmm. they are shy and they don't want to spend the time. But then after a while, they got used to it and it was very efficient with the public and they got rewarded because, in fact, science sometimes is difficult and never goes as fast as you wish. 
And in fact, this personal relationship with people who believe in you and who can be anybody from the street, as Edith was saying, gives a lot of energy. And we have done that with donors, very simple people coming and giving 20 euros a year, so it's very simple people. Just interacting with them gives so much energy that our science gets better. And maybe my second point is uh, uh, we should try and help our politicians. And uh, I'm not Austrian, so this is an unbiased point of view. But uh, I felt, uh, of course, I worked in health science, so it's maybe sometimes easier, but not only. Sometimes politicians are faced with decisions they have to make very quickly on topics on which they don't have so many experts. And I think as scientists, as an institution, we must play the game and make sure that we give them the right expertise, are totally honest, and build some kind of relationship so that they know that if they need us for something, we are going to answer to our best and very quickly. Because often, of course, it's immediately, it's like 10 minutes from now, you need an answer. And this kind of trust, uh, I think, is very important because, after all, they are the representatives of the people in the country. And so if you still believe in democracy, which is my case, I think it's very, we need a scientist to get involved and help whenever we are asked a question. And maybe these are my two points. Um, the one example I would use about uh, science and society is the, the ways in which um, I'm, a not, I'm not a scientist, so my example is what science has done to our understanding of the climate and the environment. Um, and you can tell two stories about the impact of sciences and scientists. One of them is very pessimistic, which is that despite absolutely heroic attempts by climate scientists to, to shake the public awake, uh, you know, the glaciologists are up by the Arctic Circle measuring ice cores and um, the people measuring ice pack, these are Canadian examples, or <clears throat> looking at um, um, the tear in the ozone hole at the other end of the Arctic, uh, the, the Antarctic, you can tell a, a kind of desperate story of science basically beginning to scream. Um, but here's the historian in me sees something else, which is um, popular understanding of the biosphere, of ecology, of the interdependence of all these planetary systems. The popular understanding of that really dates to about 1970. So in some extraordinary way, um, science has had a absolutely transformative effect on the way the public understands something as basic as the weather. I mean, to a degree that we need to appreciate and respect, the sedimentary effect of a lot of climate scientists saying to you, these extreme weather events, for example, are forming patterns, clusters, whose meaning you need to understand the political significance of. Um, we've got a lot of the environmental movement saying it's too little too late. The scientific, the advance in basic scientific literacy in the public is behind the problem. It's not catching up to the problem. As a historian, I, I'm slightly more optimistic. I think a, a transformation in public consciousness and awareness of the systemic interaction of um, environmental damage um, that simply didn't exist in the 1960s now does exist in 2020, and it's mostly scientists doing a lot of hard work. And that seems to me, uh, I would say, is an example of science serving society as it should. There is a counter trend, which we also need to identify, which is the problem with the spread of science is not just ignorance, it's malign manipulation of the facts as well. That is, there are very powerful institutional interests 
that have sought to deny the reality of climate change. And so there is a mighty political battle going on about this in which scientists need to step up and say, um, challenge the ways in which um, climate change denial has been supported, funded, sustained by a whole set of interests that we need to know. But I see this as, a, as one of the most revolutionary examples of a change in public consciousness in my lifetime that I would attribute to the work of scientists. And it seems to me, actually, I know I'm sailing up against a wave of skepticism here, is actually a, a good story, not a bad story, a hopeful story. progress we have seen in science over the past you know centuries really there is there what we see is an almost intrinsic dis mistrust of science in a frighteningly large part of the population i mean climate change is just one example oh. immunization take as, as yes. another example how, how how can this be explained other than an well again having been in politics, you've got to get down and dirty. You've got to go after the anti-vaxxers. You, you, know, you, you actually got to go after them. You've got to get up in a public environment and say, listen, guys, you're putting human lives at risk. Look at the risks. Here are the risks of vaccination. Here are the risks of not vaccination. This is not rocket science, folks. Do you know what I mean? You've got to fight. Uh, sometimes um, the elites the scientists are much too polite. They don't understand just how malign the forces are that they're arrayed against them. And um, we gotta take the battle, not just, not just in public lectures, not, but onto the airwaves. We've gotta have people standing for public office. We've gotta weigh right in there. And, and it is significant, in fact, that some of the crucial political battles of our time are about science, about the validity of scientific claims. And um, don't retire to your labs, because I think the point that was made earlier, which is right, is this does have direct effects on your funding. If you don't win these battles, you, the tap gets cut off. So it's a real, a real battle. And it's a real battle in the United States at the moment. So it matters which political party you vote for. It matters. These things affect how funding happens and, um, and whether children die because they haven't been vaccinated. Maybe one thing I just want to say is engaging with journalists, I think, is really important. Mm -hmm. And it's frustrating as scientists when we engage with journalists. Usually uh, it's... <laughs> <laughs> But actually, I think that is the way to make sure that the messages that are put out there to the public are far and wide. So obviously, one can also engage on the airways. But I think actually training journalists to communicate with scientists, to listen to what we're saying, and to set the record straight, you know, vaccines matter. We wouldn't all be sitting here if there weren't vaccines, if there weren't antibiotics, if there weren't. You know. So this is, this is something that we have to really positively promote. So you should maybe have a school of journalists as well at the IST. You know, I'd like to talk about this fight. I mean, um, I think we won't work if we fight it within our comfort zone. I mean, giving lectures, inviting people to provide, you know, within your institutions or universities, even within classrooms, to bring people to teach them about immunology and vaccine and nuclear physics or whatever you want, the only thing it does is it brings you the usual suspect, the kind of people who are here and everyone loves science. What we need to do is to talk to those who would not come to you. And the question, how do you get them? Now, if you use a journalist, you're not going to get there because it's saturated. You're just in the noise. So I'll give you an example for an experiment we started 10 years ago, which I think has been very successful. And um, what we do once a year, it's actually in a week from now, we go to Tel Aviv, which is you know, quite a lively city, usually, and we take the bar, 80 bars, and we send 80 professors in the bar on Thursday evening at 8 o'clock in the evening. <laughs> Talking quantum physics, immunology, cell biology, planetary science, whatever you want. <laughs> now we make big PR of it, believe it or not, we do that for 10 years, it is full of people, there's no room. There's just simply no, people are standing in the street. 
We actually have this on television. It's on the web. And I'm talking about tens, if not hundreds of thousands of people who listen to 80 different lectures in one shot in 80 bars in Tel Aviv. What you do by doing that is going to the territories. You go, I mean, you go out of your comfort zone. You reach to people who usually would not have come to you because they would be afraid, because the lecture would be too difficult, because it would have been boring, because it wouldn't have been interesting. But if you merge this with a bar where you can drink beers and, you know, in Vienna you have wonderful coffee and cakes, then in fact you, you're showing something that it's actually reachable, that is actually something one can talk about. And we've done that for 10 years. Uh, by the way, we've now been asked by bar owners to do that every week. I mean, you know, it's becoming even a business sometimes. We can actually open. But the point is, this has changed the opinion of people of what scientists are doing. Because you're telling your real story in a place, in their place, in a place where they feel confident, in a place which is, by the way, also defined as you know, fun. This is where I go in the evening to have fun. And so you're walking the right, in the right direction, and we see the result of it because it has changed the image of the Weizmann Institute, I can tell you. And we see it by the support we get from the public. We can measure it not only by the words and by the names, but in fact, even by the money. We see that in the world of philanthropy, we have support from charities and philanthropy in Israel has grown tremendously for the last 10 years. And when I ask people, why are you supporting more? I mean, you know, we're still being, doing the same science, well, not the same science as for the last 10 years, but it is the same institute. And the reason is because we see you, we hear you, mm -hmm. and you're human. You go to places where others, because as you know, scientists, in the mind of so many people, are not really human beings, but that's another story. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you want to add something? Uh, no, 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 we, no, we have that. a similar experience on the radio, so once a year, we get scientists and as many as possible, and of course it's with journalists, we have an agreement, but with all the, mostly all the radios in France, so it's not one radio, and they just go talk for two minutes. And each of them, and of course the diversity of scientists, and it's also the case of here at IST, the diversity is a huge subject. When we asked children to draw scientists, they only had men with a white beard. It was striking, and, and then we sent young women, funny guys in blue jeans with holes in their pants, and I mean everything, long hair, I mean scientists, they look all kinds of things. <laughs> and also with white beer sometimes, and the simple fact that they hear and see different voices with different accents, young, old, talking at the same time about their science and their children, makes this more human. And so it's, a, in a way, similar experience and makes a huge change. And we also measured it in, in number of donations, very striking, it's very efficient. So it has some impact, and I'm not saying it brings a lot of money, but it's a way to measure what you're doing. So science is a human activity. It's not cold and, and something happening by crazy people in a lab. And the fact, if you manage to give it a human face, you know, it makes a huge difference, I feel. That's my experience. There is an other dimension to this relationship uh, between science and the public. Of course, uh, we, are, we are paid by the public, by the taxpayer. Uh, uh, th there is, of course, this understood expectation behind this that even no matter how often uh, we repeat it, that one has to think long term, you know, uh, uh, progress rests on basic science, that uh, in the end, science is funded because an expectation of an increase in wealth and prosperity and, 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 and benefit for the economy. So that, that dimension. Uh, what does an institution like ours need to do in that respect? And I think the Weizmann, again, maybe if we start here, uh, this round again, is, is obviously a very successful example. Well, I, I, again, I think we are back to communication, but, but the problem of communication is the baseline. The baseline is very, very high. If you just use the normal communication, um, you will not get the message through it. Uh, I don't think I need to convince you anyone about the value of basic research. And the fact that the major discoveries 
that we use every single day in this world have never been by people who are trying to solve a problem. I mean, that's also a story that people don't know. And while you know, every government, or most government, are trying to strategize their scientific research, uh, what it was not strategized is what we were more successful than what it was strategized. So we can actually show that the lack of scientific strategy, and just as you do here, the you know, excellent strategy is the one which is working. There is another place where we can go, which is, um, makes the people very, very sensitive to what science is all about. And these are people who do not support you yet, and these are the children. People are very sensitive to their own children, and if you can touch their children in a positive way, they'll be extremely thankful for what you're doing. And so I believe that institutions like ours must be, and we are very, very active in science education, not in the school directly, but above, beyond, and around the schools and the teachers, uh, because that is the future generation. If we can't solve the problem, we can't change the mind of the people of today, we must be active today so that we can change the people of those who will be responsible for, for that story in 20 years from now. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the school system. That's actually an easy one, because kids are very curious. They're willing to listen, and they're also willing to say, you know, when you show them the amazing discovery, they're still amazed, right? This is not true for the usually adult public. So you can impress them, you can put a story in their mind, and then you can see the result. Of course, this is a long-range action, but you know, anyway, that's what we do. We are here for the very, very long time, uh, and we at the Vatican Institute have created basically, well, Chaim Marari, who seems to have created everything in this world, actually, including this institute, and I mean it very seriously. He's an amazing person, uh, and I know something about it. Uh, you know, really increased science education in the Vice Institute. And today we have about 230 people on payroll whose goal is to educate kids in Israel. We touch the life of 300,000 kids every year. That touched the kids for education, but also touched the parents. And the parents love it. And the story goes. And so this is another channel which we have a lot of power to do something, which the usual, you know, PR would not reach. I think it's uh, PR with content. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So uh, I think one one thing that's been raised uh, uh, earlier is is really to try and convince uh, society about the economy of knowledge. It's the most powerful economy. You know, to be able to transmit the knowledge we have and increase the knowledge we have. You know, knowledge and the quest for truth, I think, is, is truly important. And at EMBL, this economy of knowledge is very much part of uh, what we do. Uh, so we train people. Uh, we train people to do great science, to perform services that, that give back to um, other areas of, of science. And so the knowledge and the expertise is given back, but of course, um, how can you rate that? Can you put uh, dollar signs or euros to it? It's very difficult. And I think, again, the onus is on us as scientists and as directors and leaders of institutions to really preach for this economy of knowledge. You know, it's, it, it is really at the basis of what science is about. The knowledge we will deepen and the knowledge we will transmit. So, and another aspect I just wanted to touch on was um, the nature of science and scientific discovery today. We have, we were just talking about um, how you know uh, news, fake news, uh, all sorts of stuff can go out. And on the other hand, we have tremendous access to knowledge that we never did before. Science can be open, more open than ever before. And at EMBL, for example, um, a large part of what is done is bioinformatics, um, dealing with large data sets, human genomes, uh, so organisms, and giving open access, not just to scientists, but to the public and to um, health providers, for example. And that is, I think, tremendously powerful. The, the ability to be able to go there and access the data in a completely open way um, is something that I think is, is truly uh, uh, sort of powerful for society and something that we need to um, maybe transmit better. So I think for me, that is the, the importance of these institutions, the economy of knowledge and the openness of science and sharing. Thank you. So concerning the economy of knowledge, of course I agree. 
But we don't necessarily need to convince everybody in the public of that. I mean, you, you have to choose your targets and the ones, because it becomes very theoretical. I mean, how much you can save in terms of an economy or how much jobs you can create because of this discovery. So I think what we need to do is target the, the right people to explain what discoveries have allowed to do. For instance, in health, it's rather easy to explain how much can be saved by a medicine that allows people not to stay in the hospital for two weeks and, and just be home. That's very simple to explain. So we can explain that easily. We can explain easily how many jobs have been created by, Google was, uh, was quoted earlier, but we don't have, we don't necessarily have to quote American companies, but in Europe we have companies which have been created by discoveries of scientists. And I think it's very interesting to take one or two points that made a big thing. First, I, I use a very old one, which is easy, of course, having been president of Pasteur Institute. I explained how Pasteur was working on wine because the wine growers at the time could not ship their wine outside of small country, within France, but like 200 kilometers, because it was getting rotten. So they actually, asked him to solve that problem, which is what started all the discovery of microbiology. And he found a solution which is known as pasteurization and uh, which helped uh, to ship to, so that the wine would keep and it would ship everywhere. And this is the economy of wine and everybody can, ex can understand this. It's simple, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody drinks wine and you like to drink wine from Bordeaux in Austria or wherever, even in France. So that's easy enough. So we have to take a few examples, and there are more recent ones, of course, but explain why things which were not planned have developed the economy so much. And my example is very basic. I can explain it to anybody, anywhere. So I think we have to take a very few clear examples, and there are recent ones, and target the people we want to explain that to. And, and, just be convincing and be true and sincere, which is always important. I think one of the, this is an obvious point, but um, we live in a time of very extreme political polarization. And um, one of the really crucial things you want to do is somehow, somehow maintain across the political divides the ideological divides, the class divides, the social divides, but above all the partisan divides, a kind of basic commitment to long-term investment in science. I was very struck in the story that watching the politicians here, Madam and others, just <clears throat> the willingness of Austrian authorities to commit long-term and, and the willingness to commit to a budget over, I can't remember what the number was, but you're not in a year-by-year -year budget cycle. Well, that's, that's a huge victory for the kind of long-term investments you need. Well, that is a fragile plant. There are other places where that kind of political forces are unwilling to give science the funding autonomy it needs to invest long-term. And there are political interests that want to polarize the people against the elite. And that kind of stuff can very quickly um, do science damage. So maintaining that kind of fragile bipartisan consensus in favor of science on the basis of stories like Monsieur Pasteur, on the basis of the undoubted uh, core contribution of science to the modern economy, um, is, is, is critical. Um, the thing I see everywhere when I go to universities is that in 1965, I'm that old, yes, I'm that old, no one, I think, really conceived of the university as the engine room of the modern economy. Not in 1965. By 2020, the university is the engine room, of the, it's the driver of the entire modern economy, and urban development is dependent on it. Uh, uh, cities that are declining invite universities in to power them out. You go to Maastricht in Holland, they took 
uh, a declining mining area of Holland. They put a university in the middle of it. It's now the biggest employer. <clears throat> it's just powered the whole of a region that lived on coal and no longer lives on coal and is damn glad it doesn't live on coal, right? The university did that. <clears throat> That's a very powerful story, but there is one cost to it, which is somewhere along the line, you cannot simply have a utilitarian justification of science. Your institute is curiosity driven. The curiosity driven claim is crucial. You cannot link the entire funding base and the political consensus upon which it rests on the fact, which is a fact, that you're the driver of the, of the economy. You've got to have a bipartisan understanding that you've got to let a lot of curiosity-driven obsessives loose and fund them for years, going up one blind alley after another mm -hmm. till they find la bonne voie. You know, and that's a very difficult sell for, for politicians. I've been a politician. You think, yeah, sure, I like science, but God almighty, it's expensive. And it takes so much time. And you keep barking up the wrong tree. I mean, how am I supposed to explain that to my people? You know, I mean, it's a, it's a real issue. So you've got to keep working on that all the time. Thank you. I'm actually sign being signaled that we need to wrap up because we still, there's still one uh, item on the agenda, but let me thank this panel and let's give it a break. Thank you. Peter. <laughs> Thank you to everyone. Um, okay. There's at least two more items on the agenda. One, one is right there, standing up. He trumpets Vienna again with, if my friends could see me. to keep the feet still, at least for me. Um, we've had a lot of food for the mind and some for the soul, and it's about getting time for the body. This, after all, is a birthday party, and there's no such thing as a real birthday party without a cake. So please bring on the sweets.
Now, may I please ask President Hensinger, Governor Mikkel Leitner, and Mr. Reidel to put yourselves behind that cake for the pictures. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> um, <laughs> Nehmen Sie doch bitte jeder ein Messer in die Hand, genau. <laughs> Schaut gefährlich aus. Auf die Plätze, fertig. Geht. Ich glaube, jetzt geht ein Anschnitt, oder? Ja, alle drei, alle drei. <lacht> Jawohl. Okay. <lacht> you don't have to do it. <lacht> You don't have to do it all. <laughs> With this, we've come to the end of the official part of this evening. And <laughs> Mrs. Governor, it's very <laughs> While this cake is being cut into pieces, most probably sufficient for all of you, and you don't have to do it all, it will be done out there. <laughs> there's more plates out there too. Um, all there's left to do for me is, I would like to invite you on behalf of the IST to a buffet reception out there, where you can also get a piece of that cake. Keep enjoying the night, keep celebrating ISD's 10th birthday and thank you all for coming. <laughs>